Namaste, family of light. Namaste, family of light online. Uh, we're so glad you guys are here to celebrate this incredibly special day with us. This is the end of our Holy Week, uh, which started last Sunday with Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus entered into Jerusalem amidst a huge crowd laying uh, palm fronds at his feet as he passed through the city triumphantly as the King of Peace. Uh, and then, of course, Friday, Good Friday, is the day that Jesus was crucified. Um, and today, we are, we are on Easter Sunday. This is the Resurrection Day. This is probably the holiest day. And Christianity is one of the things that, that makes up the core uh, fundamentals of, uh, of this belief. And uh, we are going to celebrate it in style and with a few stories and with some, some great messages today. Uh, we want to start off, we want to have uh, our brother Ed uh, play a few songs for us to get us in the mood and to get us going. Ed, you want to take it away? Okay, this one is easy and we need your help. I'll play through it once and you can join in. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Absolutely. It's Resurrection Day. It's Glorious Day. I see the glory of God shining on His people. Feel His presence and I know I am love. What a glorious day. What a glorious day to be alive. Amen. Amen. I see God's river of life. Thank you, Lord, 
Thank you, Jesus, for this amazing and wonderful day. And a day that you were risen and you came back, saving us from our own ignorance. <laughs> All right, we have a few readings today. Um, if you have uh, the, the flyer here. Uh, the first one we are going to do is the re We Remember. We can all read as one. We are spiritual beings of light, one with the source of all creation. We remember all is one. We remember we are creators and part of a divine creative plan. We remember we are here in physical expression as guardians and stewards to earth as we work in collaboration with spirit, spiritual beings of light from various streams of consciousness. We work together, founded by love, to liberate Earth Mother, to take her place as a world of peace. We walk the path of love and light. And from Alice Bailey, uh, one of the great spiritual leaders of her time, who created the great invocation with the help of uh, Ascended Master Dua Cool, which is uh, very special on this day because this is this is the day, this is Easter, this is the day that Christ made his resurrection and his return to earth after his crucifixion. So for me all, as one, read the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the points of God, within this heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Amen. Very possible. Not anymore. <laughs> Your timing is impeccable. <laughs> All right, Sister Catherine just walked in. Perfect timing as always. She's been such a, an amazing help here. I also want to say, uh, thank you and happy Easter and many, many blessings to our family of light who are not here, Shane Elizabeth, Reverend Nancy, Reverend Annie, they're all away on mission, uh, doing good things in the world for, for uh, you know, for our, our benefit, for the benefit of the light, for the benefit of the Amish to die. Um, and we can't thank them enough for the hard work and the sacrifices that they have to make in order to go out to the world to help people in need and to learn and gather information and resources for us to continue doing what we do here. So namaste, Sharon Elizabeth, Reverend Nancy, and Reverend Annie. Namaste. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, as, a, as a symbolic gesture of how we are all one uh, in God's love, how we are one in Christ consciousness, we have a little uh, ceremonial uh, candle lighting set up here. Uh, if everybody wants to come up and light a candle to, to symbolize our lights coming together as one. Just want to come up, that would be awesome one at a time. Or you can come up all together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste.
Yeah, we will give a little bit of flood flooding in the uh in the sanctuary here due to all the, the wonderful rain and this is Florida so we can't say we don't need the rain. <clears throat> all right. Are we ready to continue? Yes. All right. Well that's going on over there. It's being taken care of, being handled. Uh just a little bit of bit of trivia. Today's Easter, and this is the end of, of Holy Week, but it's also for, for for the Christian faith, but it's also Holy Week for for Judaism and also for Islam too. This is uh, the Passover week and also Ramadan. And those and Holy Week occurs for all three of those uh, simultaneously within the same same period. So every 33 years. I thought that was an interesting note that. It's every 33 years that we get the three major religions we have here on 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 earth kind of like happening at the same time yeah <laughs> it's, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool and like we discussed uh the the good friday uh was the day of Jews, of jesus's crucifixion and that day was a terrible day for all of his follow followers uh, ended up being a great day for for all of us. I guess that's why it's called Good Friday. I never really considered that before, but his followers believe that he was truly gone, and that um, through his life and um, his message of peace and love uh, had that uh, was destined to change the world had had died with him, uh, and died with him. They had placed all their hope and you know, um, all their, their time and these their, their disciples, apostles, uh, and all his followers made a lot of sacrifices uh, in order to, to, to follow him, to, to take in his message. Um, and now he was gone. And it wasn't until one of his disciples, Mary Magdalene, went to visit the tomb of Jesus um, three days later and discovered that the tomb was empty. And at the same time, pretty much discovered that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. Um, Mary and all the other apostles uh, discovered that this was truly good news, as we talked about, uh, that Jesus was on, was on earth. And now his ministry was only uh, just beginning. He had risen in the Holy Spirit and was poised to repair all that was broken uh, in in our society and within mankind and restore Christ consciousness to the earth and help us realize and awaken it within each one of us. So Easter is a reminder us that Jesus is alive within us through the Christ, Christ consciousness and that we can have hope to continue on our path of spiritual and conscious evolution uh, by bringing forth the Christ within us. And if, we, if we're being honest with ourselves, um, we really need that renewal of hope in the world today. We know what's going on in the world. We know, you know what's going on in your daily lives. We all face uh, frustrations and, uh, you know, life isn't always easy. Um, sometimes these lower, these lower emotions, hate, anger, fear can overwhelm us and cause us, you know, and they uh, can pose great challenges in our, in our lives. I'm going to grab a sip of water. I was saying, get a little dry mouth up here. Uh, 
<laughs> you were baptized in the fall and the water is coming in. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So um, some of the lessons that, that we have had, that we've had to learn um, or go through, the challenges that we have to go through this year, they could be, you know, devastating losses or relationships that have been suffering, kind of languishing, um, and things that we've had to, to, come, to come to terms with. Um, all this can be such a heavy, heavy burden on us that it sometimes makes us question our faith makes us question if God is really present in our lives and still working in the world, you know. Um, but what the resurrection tells us is that even in the middle of all of this chaos, all of this, you know, emotional turbulence, in our darkest, in our darkest hour, God is still there. Just like he was there for Mary uh, when she opened the tomb uh, and realized that Jesus' body was gone, as we'll talk about a little bit later. There's still light because of the salvation that Christ bestowed upon us from his sacrifice. In the early morning of that third day when Mary went to the tomb, scripture tells us that she had come to anoint his body for burial, for a proper burial, as was the Jewish tradition at the time. But when she arrived at the tomb, which had been sealed by a large round stone and had uh, some Roman guards uh, posted outside of it so that no one would, would interfere uh, with Jesus's body. When on the third day, when the soldiers rolled the, the uh, or when she rolled the, 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 the stone away, um, she discovered that the tomb was, it was empty and she started to cry. In scripture, this is, this uh, comes to us in John, cha John chapter 20, verse 11 and 14, um, which reads, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she turned back to look in the tomb and saw two angels seated where Jesus's body had been. The angels turned to her and asked, woman, why are you crying? Mary responds, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. And then she got really upset, turned around and nearly bumped into Jesus as she was exiting the tomb. <laughs> Although she didn't realize that it was him at the time. We'll get to that a little bit. We'll finish up the story. So when Mary goes in the, into the tomb, uh, she didn't see Jesus and she came there with the purpose of anointing his body and preparing it for a proper, proper burial. Um, and it wasn't until the angels called out to her that she had you know, some sense of what was going on. And they asked why she was crying, and she was heartbroken that not only had her teacher that she had loved and cherished and followed with all of her heart was dead, but his body was gone too, and she considered this a violation to her to herself. And this is this can also happen to us when we lose hope. We feel like when we are when something happens to us, when you know someone cuts us off in traffic or you know, steals, breaks into our house and starts stealing our possessions or just treats us wrongly. We feel upset. We get upset about that. And we feel a little uh, violated that our, that our, our principles have been, been violated. Um, and we end up losing ourselves in these emotions. And our future, what happens then is we, 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 we can't really see clearly. Um, and just like Mary, it's easy to fixate on the things that that we, we, it's easy for us to fix it on things that we don't have, uh, either you know, emotionally or monetarily, job-wise, um, just all the things that, um, that are not present in our lives, what someone else did to us, their unkindness, things that are missing from our lives. So like Mary, we failed, we, didn't, we don't recognize the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives, or that the fact that he is active in our lives, working for us, fighting for us doing the heavy lifting for us. In John chapter 20, verse 14, says she was leaving the tomb. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And she almost ran into him, but she didn't realize it was him. Um, the way uh, the apostle John tells the story is that she thought he was the gardener and that he had done something with the body. He had come and taken it away. Uh, and the whole gardener thing kind of uh, 
goes back to the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Peace and Love that is our rightful inheritance. And Jesus uh, being, uh, her seeing Jesus as, as the gardener, you know, someone who can come in and replant, you know, the seeds of hope and love and forgiveness. So she thought Jesus was the gardener because she didn't recognize what was going on. She didn't recognize that the resurrected Jesus was the hope and the promise that was to be delivered was standing right in front of her. She was unable to see because she was living, she was in a fog of despair over her master's, her teacher's body being, being gone. But she had not come to the tomb expecting to find a living risen Christ there. And that this day, this resurrection day is a reminder that the Christ consciousness is inside us, ready to be awakened at, the, at any time. It is awakening within us. I feel there's, there's a lot of good in the world and a lot of, you know, God moving through all of us in various different ways. Um, and we know that this happens, uh, but it can also be very, very subtle and we can easily overlook uh, some of the things in our lives. Uh, and sometimes they're just, they're just such simple things like having a conversation with a friend, you know, things trouble us. And, uh, you know, when we kind of like let that out, that is that Christ, the Christ consciousness in someone else, uh, again, alleviating, alleviating uh, those frustrations, those fears, those whatever. This is, this is the great bond of humanity. This is also, you know, the symbolic or an actual literal way of us sharing our light, sharing our, our, our the Christ consciousness and our, our, our I am presence. Um, a small prayer that gets answered is another way God works through us. An unexpected phone call from a friend or a family member, someone we haven't heard from in a long time, that's been on my, on our, my mind, man, where did that person go? I hope they're doing okay. Boom, you know, we get a call from them or a message from them out of the blue. Um, financial windfalls. I had some, a few weeks ago, I was having some, uh, some uh, I, was, I was at the end of my paycheck, right? Bless you. <laughs> and uh, from out of the blue, just just in the nick of time when I when I needed it to get some repairs done to my car, I get this huge uh, check from a client of mine that I'd worked with a long time ago that I had completely forgotten about, and it just came at just the right time. I prayed for it. Um, I, I'd asked God, "Hey, you know, I'm getting to the end here. I need this. I really could use some help. Is there anything you could help me out?" with this financial situation. Boom, two days later, check in the mail. No kidding. I mean, this is this is the spirit of God moving through us. It happens in these weird subtle ways and sometimes we don't even realize it. Um, again, I know we talked about this uh, earlier. I do not. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, there we go. Spirit of God is, spirit of God is alive and, and in us. Um, I, and I talked about this a few weeks ago uh, about just the, the kindness of staying strangers when we meet out in the world, and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, you just see somebody holding a door open, you know, just showing just basic, you know, just kindness, brotherly love. I think that was the topic we were we were talking about, and uh, that's a beautiful expression of of the Christ consciousness coming through them and affecting your life. Because man, I mean, think about it. I mean, someone does the kindness for us. Someone says, you know, treats us uh, with, with, with respect and with the dignity that, you know, is, is, uh, is that we're worthy of. Um, and yeah, it can lift our spirits, especially if, we, if we're in a bad mood, you know? And then, you know, our spirits are lifted and we go out into the world and we share that with everyone else. And it's just, it's just beautiful. This beautiful coming together, this beautiful network. Um, so, and also, we find the hope, the love, the spirit of God, and just showing gratitude. You know, gratitude. You know, I, I drive to work every morning, and you know, whew, tomorrow's Monday, and I know it's going to come early. You know, I got to be at the office, but I get this amazing, beautiful sunrise on my drive, and whatever I'm going through, he immediately snaps out of it. Gratitude. For that beautiful vision, you know, for that, that beautiful light that's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is this is the work of God. 
You know, this is God working through my life, working through all of our lives. Um, and Jesus's compassion, you know, the, the, the message, the compassion that he showed that he loves us. You know, he loves all of us equally. God loves all of us equally. And that his message of divine love and peace um, is received in our hearts. It is his compassion that causes him to resurrect, causes him to sacrifice himself, causes him to resurrect, uh, return from death as the Holy Spirit, as the, I, as the I am presence, the I am that I am, the Christ consciousness that has risen and dwells within us. He meets Mary at the doorway of the open tomb and Jesus, again, with the compassion. Mary, why are you so upset? Why are you crying? <laughs> I love this part. <laughs> Who are you looking for, he asked. And again, like I said, she thought she was the gardener and she asked him, sir, please, if you've taken him away, tell me where he is and I will go get him so I can anoint his body and give him proper burial. Jesus was like, Mary, <laughs> Mary, it's me. And <laughs> as soon as he called her name, as soon as he called her by name, she snapped out of it. And she cried out to him, teacher. She finally recognized the spirit of Jesus Christ. That was, that was right in front of her. And Christ calls us all by name. He knows us all inside and out. And he's always present within us. And he's always looking to connect with us. He's always calling our name. You know, it's up to us if we want to answer, if we want to recognize what's in front of us, what's inside of us, what's in our hearts. But Jesus said, don't cling to me. In other words, don't be so attached to the physical, personal personality of me. Don't be attached to my body not being here. For I am ascended. I'm ascending to the Father. Go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Jesus wanted, wanted her to know, wanted everybody to know that just as God is a part of him, God is also a part of us. We are part of God. We are part of Jesus, the Christ consciousness. And even though Mary had given up hope, again, the, with the compassion and the love and the, the brotherly love and the concern for her well-being, he was there to comfort her in his risen form. The resurrected Jesus is the cosmic Christ consciousness that is awaking within us through the power of his divine love. And like Mary, sometimes in the middle of the most difficult times, we can't recognize it. We lose touch with that, that inner, that inner love, that inner peace that we experience when the Christ consciousness is active and expressing itself through us. Again, spirit of Christ is always active within us. It's always there, even in the midst of our greatest struggles, all we got to do is just turn to it and we will find it there within us. And we can feel the shift just like Mary, when we have that activation, when we have that, that love and we have that remembrance of the message of Jesus's you know, peace and compassion. When we feel that us, we return to ourselves. We become resurrected in spirit. We return to life and the, the, we receive a healing from that beautiful expression of Christ consciousness that is blooming within us, blossoming within us. So imagine today, if we are able to see that Christ consciousness, that spirit all around us and every single person, just imagine if, if we had that vision, we do have that vision, we do. Just imagine everybody you see has Christ consciousness you know, has this, this essence, this reflection of Jesus Christ in their hearts. And so 
what Easter wants to tell us, what the resurrection wants to remind us, is that when we look for the Christ consciousness within and with others, and when we hear the master, master teacher's voice call us by name, we have an obligation to answer. Because he is us, we are him. God is us, we are God in spirit, in Christ consciousness. So I want to invite everybody here and everybody online to take a moment, just take a moment, take a deep breath, and just recognize the risen Christ that is within us. Just take a moment, take a deep breath, and just focus on that. Feel that flow. Awaken to the Christ consciousness within our hearts, the birth of a new life, of love and peace within us and in the world around us. Just feel the flow coming through. Look around you, see it beaming, shining out of others. All right. On the back of your programs, there's a resurrection prayer. I would like all of us to read this. I think it's more than a prayer. I think it may serve as, as an oath to ourselves, to the betterment of ourselves. If you're ready. Jesus, thank you for the hope I find in your resurrection. The story of your transcendence renews my spirit and inspires me to greater faith in the cosmic Christ consciousness that is the I am that I am. Master teacher, I don't want to miss you today. I want to be you in your divine fullness and trust in your loving grace for my life, the earth and all of humanity. I ask that you illuminate the heart of my being and shine your light into all of the empty spaces in the world that are in need of your healing and love and forgiveness. May all the people of the world find their hope in you as the Christ consciousness in each of us awakens and takes its proper place within as Christ returns to earth. Thank you, God, for this and all of our blessings. Amen. 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 Whew. Wonderful. I feel the energy, the love of God flowing through me. Christ consciousness, energy shining forth. I want to thank you all for hearing my story. I want to thank you all for acknowledging and recognizing the risen Christ that is in each one of you. And I ask sincerely, please share that. There are so many people who need that and they may not even know it. They may be spiritual, they may be faithful, but like we discussed, we all go through difficulties. We all have trials we have to face. This is the time when that Christ light, that Christ consciousness can really affect change for the positive in someone else's life. Please share it. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters. I love you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Robin, good next. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And if this is not divine timing, we were baptized in the beautiful divine waters. The thunder came, rolled past, you know, took away the stone of the tomb. And now we have the beautiful sunlight coming in. Yes. It is absolutely divine at the divinely appointed time. And I want to thank all of you for coming here today at this beautiful Easter service. All of your lights are shining bright. We thank Reverend Richard. We thank our beautiful musician here, Ed. And we are going to have a glorious day. But I'm going to be here to teach you a little bit. Jesus was a teacher and he taught his disciples. And as many of you know, I've been uh, a Rosicrucian for 40 years. And so I'm entrenched in the mystery school teachings, but so was Jesus. And this is 
a beautiful lesson today to show you that Jesus was teaching his disciples natural and universal laws. And he wasn't alone when he was being crucified. And I'm going to show you how he was able to project and teach you why. This is in the archives in the mystery school teachings on the day of the crucifixion. And you will walk away with a true understanding of his disciples that we are to become his disciples. We are the living Christ. The Holy Spirit descended upon us. Christ gave it up. And then he again goes ahead and takes it and dispenses it to all of his 120 disciples. And then he arises in his risen form up into the clouds. But I want to teach you this so that you truly understand that this is written. We know this and show you how he was instructing his disciples. And we are his disciples today. So Jesus had his connection to the mystery schools. We know this. He was in a scene. Mary was in a scene. Joseph was in a scene. And I've actually talked about this before in other lectures that you can actually find on the Cosmic Center's um, YouTube channel. He was schooled in them, and he taught in the tradition of the mystery schools. Why this was important to his mission is going to be very forthcoming. It was important to his crucifixion because you're going to see his teachings. He was able to teach his disciples to be worthy, to carry on the mission, and to receive with the breath. That's in the Bible. You will see he breathed. That was the only time that it's mentioned in the Bible. He breathed into them. He had already prepared the way. The disciples were prepared. And he, has, he was able to transfer this beautiful inheritance that he received, that he gave up when he was on the cross, onto his disciples. He literally transmitted to them the golden keys that unlock the gates and open the portals to all the Christian temples, tabernacles, to all the hearts and souls, and to all the schools of life that exist today. He would teach like other initiates before him, which was having a, in place concentric circles of worthy initiates. So think of concentric circles. He would teach in parables so that the uninitiated would receive an enlightened message, as well as teach and use symbols to demonstrate a higher level of understanding. From the multitudes that he would teach, he would find a few that would question, would be curious, would have an openness, and he would know them. He brought them closer and then gave them more knowledge. Remember in the Bible, when you are a little babe, you are fed pablum. When you are worthy, you are given meat. So he would teach in concentric circles, bringing closer those that were worthy and giving them higher teachings. From those he would bring into his circle, and then they would be initiated and be given more understanding. It may surprise some, but within the teachings of the mystery schools, it is known that Jesus had 120 close disciples with each of the 12 known ones having nine others under them. And each of the 12 were instructed with a particular discipline. They represented differing aspects of Jesus's ministry. The knowledge that I will be revealing tonight is from two sources and can be found on the rosacrucian.org website. I went ahead and I put it in even on the Zoom chat where you can see uh, where it's rosacrucian.org with the books and all of those are literally posted free of charge freely given to those that seek the light and more knowledge. The two books are the secret doctrines of Jesus and the mystical life of Jesus, both of which were written by the Rosicrucian leader and imperator H Spencer Lewis. I'm going to even just show you just for a second. I actually have one of them. So here, this is the one. This is the mystical life of Jesus, a very old copy. I got it so many years ago. It's probably a collector's item. And then even today, the Rosicrucians are entrenched 
And this is by Lonnie Edwards, who's a doctor, Spiritual Laws That Govern Humanity in the Universe. I just want to show you there's natural and divine laws that are in operation. You know the yogis are taught, right? All kinds of things. You can do all kinds of miracles. Well, Jesus was fooled by them. And he was the divine instrument. So he could take those even to a higher level, right? So knowing that Jesus was intimately connected to the mystery schools and that the true Christian doctrines and practices are fraught with real mysteries of the secret mission of Jesus and his disciples is very important to understand. Jesus's mission was to first practice and apply these mysteries and then dispense the secret laws involved in them to the worthy disciples and thus enable them to carry out their special missions throughout the world. So this gives you the insight that they already knew what was happening. This was in play. To understand this more fully, I think it is very important to know that mystery schools were in existence for 4,000 years before Christ was born. They were located and well established in Palestine, Persia, India, Tibet, Galilee, and a very large temple located in Heliopolis, Egypt, which was called Helios, the temple of the sun. These secret schools and movements were established and devoted to the preservation and perpetuation of revealed wisdom. Jesus was born into a family that was part of a mystery school. This brotherhood knew and was shown that he was the son of God. Do you remember when the Magi came? They were the elect of the mystery schools. And they gave him not just frankincense and myrrh and gold. They actually gave him a rosary and Mary and uh, Joseph. But Jesus was given a necklace that literally showed that he was the son of God. He had absolute entrance into the schools at Mount Carmel. So he had the monetary type of financial support, but he also had the spiritual support into all the mystery schools. And he was schooled. They expected him. Everything awaited his presence. And the, the brotherhood gave him what he needed to succeed in his mission. As such, he was schooled in the mysteries and of the points and principles of organization that had already been laid out for 4,000 years. They had already been established among the secret schools in the near and far east. Even some of the terminology and secret symbols which Jesus used and to which he referred in a veiled manner in his conversations, preachments, and allegorical stories were identical with those of other schools and instantly recognized by members of foreign or distant secret movements. And these are the same in many ways today. Jesus would meet his close followers in some secret place known only to them and teach them and demonstrate to them universal and cosmic laws. And you can actually find some references in the Bible about this. There's several verses, but you'll see he's meeting in conclaves. He showed them how natural and divine laws work in unison, were parts of the procedure and demonstrations at each of these secret meetings he would have with them. He taught them the way to eternal life, the true immortality of the soul the purification of the body and the self within, the attainment of spiritual beauty, divine power and attunement with God were carefully explained step by step in class lessons and in personal instruction. And Jesus would know that some were more questioning. Some were like Thomas. They needed to be shown. I need to have that right in front of me, concrete, right? but others had more of an etheric understanding like Mary Magdalene, you see? And he would teach according to the disciple, their knowledge at which they could receive and understand and know. 
the law of the triangle and the significance of the Trinity were fundamental in all of the philosophical discussions, in all of the alchemical or physical demonstrations of God's universal laws. Jesus understood that that's how he could perform the miracles, but he wasn't here just to demonstrate the miracles, was he? He was here for much more than that. It's to teach us, to give us what he was given. He was the template on which we are to follow. And so now when you start to see this, Jesus is instructing his disciples. He's not just saying, have faith and I'm gone here, you're gonna do it. He's teaching them personal instruction so that they are capable. And I think that's really important for us to know. He also taught them and assured his disciples that the time would come when God's promise would be fulfilled and the Holy Ghost would descend upon them as it had upon him. And that with this benediction from God, he, as their master teacher, would also give them authority to go out into the world and to not only teach and preach as he had done, but perform miracles that he had performed and do even greater things. This is written in John. He was preparing them to continue the mission. Jesus knew that from the lives of the previous lights of the world, from the prophecies of the great patriarchs, from the visions that God had revealed to him, that he must suffer this persecution at the hands of the very ones he would help, and that he would be portrayed by the one he trusted. And that again, as in thousands of instances, in the story of past civilizations, one traitor must be found in the midst of the true and loyal to exemplify the spirit of darkness and the character of Satan. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Judas was one of Jesus's most trusted disciples. And he suffered greatly for what he did. You have to ask if this was a role that Jesus asked him to play. If this was like a stage and Jesus was showing through application and demonstration this whole story, I just wonder if Jesus asked Judas. He knew he was going to do it, but I'm wondering if that was part of the contract. Something to ponder there, because it was like a play for the whole stage, right? And he's enacting this at many different levels. Jesus knew that he, the great master, must carry his cross to the place of persecution and suffer upon it and be entombed as of the dead and thus be prepared for his ultimate ascension into the kingdom of perfect peace and love. The special 12 students who represented his bodyguard and executive board, so now you can see there were others under them, and who were to be known to the world as his only secret followers. They performed their proper duties during the hours of suffering. Now this gives me comfort to know this. While the other 100, he has 120, right? While the other 100 plus or more, including his mother during the crucifixion, perform their silent duties always mindful of the watchful eye of the enemy. At his crucifixion, his band of the 120 dedicated disciples surrounded the theater of Golgotha, making a mystic circle, the power of which raised Jesus beyond human injury or human defilement. That instead of this being the final act in the closing of the tomb, bringing an end to the career of a mysterious miracle worker. It was merely the temporary closing of a tomb that would be opened again and from which would arise the great redeemer of humanity, whose power had ascended while he was upon the cross, but would descend again, not upon one, 
but upon the mystical number of 120. That through this transformation of Jesus and the transference of his power of the Holy Ghost, there would be brought into the world the beginning of a new kingdom that would be eternal on earth. Jesus was known as the Savior and the Lamb. And now let me explain this to you. Throughout the ages of what the Lamb had been the symbol of a great mystery, and its blood had been spared and used for special sacrifices at times throughout the cycles of unfolding civilization. But the populace had never really realized the spiritual or mystical significance of the ceremony. And it had remained the mystery of all mysteries, unrevealed even to the greatest lights that had hinted at its significance. Jesus, as part of his greater mission, was not to continue to mystify his followers with the symbol of the lamb or with reference to the blood or with further reference to the possibility of what it meant his mission was to actually demonstrate it he was going to demonstrate the mystery and that's what he was doing with the crucifixion he would rend the veil asunder and expose to the soul of all human beings the process of purification and the way to salvation that's how he demonstrated. That was the difference. Some of the most ancient of the mystery symbols and secret signs used in allegorical and mystical writings and teachings were the triangle, the cross, the circle, the square, and their components thereof, such as a straight vertical line, a straight horizontal line, a diagonal line, and a curved line. Jesus did not arbitrarily adopt these ancient symbols in connection with the system of his secret communication of knowledge. He used them with purpose. And so we find Jesus using these ancient sacred symbols in the same way in which they have been used for ages to represent a fundamental truth. But in the light of new revelations and the new mysteries he was about to give his disciples, these symbols and allegories in which they were interwoven to make a seemingly understandable story present take on a new light, a new power of reaching the soul and the mind. This is why we find in the books of the New Testament so many references to the disciples to the fact that Jesus told them many things in parables. Now, did you know there were seven? parables in the Bible. There's only seven. Three were given only to his secret, his 12 disciples. The four were given to the multitude. Even that is a mystical number seven, and it's got all kinds of significance to it. He would teach to the multitude in simple and meaningful lesson, but to the higher initiates, he would also be teaching another lesson simultaneously. So you can see he's actually doing some of these um, symbols with his hands. Now remember, he's teaching to the masses and you got the Romans and you have all of the rabbis from all the Sadducees and the Pharisees are all out to get him. Jesus was so smart. <laughs> he was teaching simultaneously these higher teachings that gave forth a higher wisdom giving the signs and symbols, using words that have another meaning. But he's also instructing to the multitude certain beautiful parables that they could wrap their minds around. That's how brilliant he was. So you can see, remember, he's speaking from the Sea of Galilee, from the mountains, and, and to all passerbyers. He's wise enough to understand they're trying to get at him in any way. There's a secret veal teaching going on. He would teach to the Jew and Gentiles alike and would even make accommodations by using Hebrew with the Jews and Aramaic when addressing the Gentiles. Did you know that? He used every means which would aid him in teaching the masses symbolically and allegorically, 
conveying the truths that would help them without placing in their hands the secret truths and the doctrines which they would misuse, misapply, and probably never comprehend in the right manner. That's why it's given in different steps. That's why the higher teachings are only given to those that are found worthy. However, with his hands, he would make certain signs, right? Which would appear to the pastor buyers as mere gestures to accompany his oratory, but which would appear to his initiated students as signs revealing the symbolic truths that he was giving them. In the parables were words and phrases which had dual meanings. The word wine meant a commercial product to the grape growers and winemakers, but to the initiated, it had another deeper meaning. When he spoke of fishing, this also had a dual meaning, as well as fish, fish hook, net. They all have different meanings in Kabbalah. He taught his disciples that the most perfect realization of the steps toward bringing about the kingdom of heaven on earth would be fulfilled after his crucifixion by dividing his own responsibilities, his own features of missionary work, and his own efforts among the 120 and making each disciple or worker a specialist in one or two particular requirements or necessities. This is where it gets really beautiful, guys. And we're gonna have an anointing. It is recorded in the Mystery School archives that while Jesus was upon the cross, suffering the utmost of physical, mental, and emotional torment, he gave expression to words and terms that were intended to revive and strengthen the faith of his students and disciples. So we have in the archives more information that he was literally saying, even while he was being crucified, certain words that meant things to his disciples. Now, he then projected himself to the 100 plus disciples with like remote view, right? You can project. The yogis know how to do this, but Christ did. I'm just letting you know this has been recorded. He projected himself in this, in his uh, light body to his 100 plus disciples to a place they were all gathered with the windows and doors locked. When they questioned him whether this was the great miracle he was had, had, had been telling them about, he says and replies, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, and that's in Acts 1-7. They knelt in the form of two interlaced triangles. So that's when this was part of the ceremony when he would meet with them, right? Two interlaced triangles, which is like the Star of David, right? The tetrahedron within a circle so they would have the people in a circle and they would kneel and with the two interlaced um, triangles and they had knelt on many occasions when he had taught them in secret meeting places he's in the center he appears there he raised his hands while in the center of the mystic circle and says to them peace be with you in the same manner in which my father sent me and transferred onto me the power of the Holy Spirit, I now ordain you and prepare you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit that was mine. Jesus then breathed into them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. After he was crucified, he met with his disciples for 40 days in a resurrected light body. He instructed them on many things. And then at the completion of that day, after this time of definite instruction, they moved silently with Jesus out into the stillness of the setting sun and assembled in a cave beneath a great rock, where the last rites of their mystical ceremony had been performed with all 120. 
Only the 11 close disciples remained. They were moved, they then moved up to the top of the rock beneath where all had been previously assembled. So I want you to kind of get this in your mind. They formed themselves in a circle with Jesus in the center facing the sun. And his back, with his, with it in the center, he was facing the sun. The disciples folded their arms in a mystical salutation with the right hand over the left breast and their feet placed in a certain way. He faced them and told them to receive from his Father in heaven the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost and the divine authority to carry on work as an official apostle. He explained to them to not leave the location until they felt the influx of the Holy Ghost. With that said, he placed his hands on his heart. And a light came down and formed a mist all around him, and he was lifted to the heavens. The disciples saw this and, and marveled. Then an angel appeared and said, gaze no longer into the mist in which your master has ascended, for he has left you. So shall he come again to you again and again, for his earthly mission is accomplished and he shall dwell in your hearts and in the hearts of all those you love and will henceforth direct the mission of his life through his messengers of light. Receive ye therefore from your father, which is in heaven, the Holy Ghost and the word. And by these ye shall have the power to demonstrate the spiritual laws of the kingdom of heaven and the keys to the portals of the future. So may we, with these beautiful holy words, keep these precious ideas close to our own hearts, that we are the messengers of light. And may we enact Jesus Christ's sacred mission. Jesus entrusted his disciples, and he entrusts us. He lives in us today. We become the messengers of light. And this requires sacrifice and diligence and dedication. And this is truly a lifelong journey of strict discipline, acquiring virtues, shedding vices, and living the example, the template of Christ himself. He gave us the story. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to have an anointing, but I want to um do the anointing and then i want to be reading the angel of peace so why don't i do that now because then i'm going to do the anointing you'll have the water um and then i'm going to give you some frankincense and then he's going to ed's going to have, have this beautiful song about peace it's absolutely phenomenal let me just tell you a little bit that Jesus, we have the, the Essene gospel of peace, and you can find this, you can find it on the websites. Jesus not only was instructing his disciples in the ways and laws and demonstrations of cosmic law, he would instruct his Essene brotherhood. And we have the entire book that was revealed and the Vatican had it, and now we have it. But he gave his disciples things to do every single day and to look with blessings and angels. And I thought it was very apropos since Jesus is instructing his disciples and we are his disciples today. Peace be with us, right? To be reading from his own words, the angel of peace that he gifted his Essene brotherhood with. So close your eyes and I just want you to envision this because these are Jesus's own words. I will invoke the angel of peace, whose breath is friendly, whose hand is clothed in power. In the reign of peace, there is neither hunger nor thirst, neither cold wind nor hot wind, neither old age nor death. In the reign of peace, both animals and men shall be undying. Waters and plants shall be undrying. 
and the food, the food of life shall be never failing. It is said that the mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills righteousness. There shall be peace as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. Peace shall come down like rain upon mowed grass as showers that water the earth. Like we had today. In the reign of peace shall the law grow strong and the children of light shall have dominion from sea to sea unto the ends of the earth. The reign of peace hath its source. In the heavenly father, by his strength, he setteth fast the mountains. He maketh the outgoings of morning and evening to rejoice in the light. He bringeth to earth the river of the law to water and enrich it. He maketh soft the earth with showers. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing, O heavenly father, bring unto thy earth the reign of peace. Then shall we remember the words of him who taught of old the children of light. I give the peace of thy earthly mother to thy body in the peace of thy heavenly father to thy spirit. And let the peace of both reign among the sons of men. Come to me all that are weary and that suffer in strife and affliction. For my peace will strengthen thee and comfort thee. For my peace is exceedingly full of joy. Wherefore do I always greet thee after this manner? Peace be with thee. Do thou always therefore so greet one another that upon thy body may descend the peace of the earthly mother and upon thy spirit the peace of the heavenly father. And then wilt thou find peace among thyself, for the kingdom of the law is within thee. And return to thy brothers and give thy peace to them also. Be happy are they that strive for peace, for they will find the peace of the heavenly father and give to every one thy peace, even as I have given my peace unto thee. For my peace is of God. Peace be with thee. Isn't that beautiful? And those are Christ's own words, the angel of peace. So may you come up and here's the water and I will anoint you with peace. And could you play some beautiful music now? Richard, would you like to hold the water for everyone? The water, the purification, and the anointing of the fragrance of oil.
Beautiful. So this will conclude our service. We have many ongoing events. We have the Course in Miracles. We have the chakras. We have all kinds of stuff, and I want to refer you to our website. Uh, this is, yeah, the chakras and their functions with uh, uh, our Reverend Nancy Robin, Robinson. We also have the Anchoring Light every Monday. Uh, and look, the sun. See, the sun is the coming pink, in. The pink bird just came over. Oh, a pink bird. The, the, um, what do you call it? Yeah, he just flew right past us. So our animal kingdom is speaking, a cosmic phenomenon. We had the waters, then we have the sun, we have the thunder, and we have each other. And I want all of you really to know that you are the messengers of light. We are to spread this beautiful peace to others and within ourselves and in our lives and upon this planet. So go forth. He's got this beautiful, wonderful song about peace and then one with going forth and uh our musician ed will be playing that would you like to see a few more uh things we also have to remind you about a donation a ccosl forward slash donate online and there's a basket there and we'll let richard say his i just want to th thank everybody again for being here on this glorious day um uh we have the resurrected spirit in all of us i think we got a little bit of knowledge about you know, um, you know, Jesus's path and how that was instilled within him um, and, and, and how he chose, it with, chose to share it with, with all of us. Um, so yes, go forth into the world, be those disciples of light, you know, carry forth the message, the beautiful message uh, that Jesus uh, came here with and sacrificed and died with, divine love and divine peace in the hearts of all mankind. Brother Ed, take it away, sir. My peace, my peace is all I've got that I can give. Namaste, everyone. Have a blessed Easter. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. We love you. We love you. You shall be clothed with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you shall be my witnesses throughout the ends of the
Yeah. Amen. Amen. 